So we, we do go through the Torah portion here at Revive, um, not always adopting the Torah portion every, every service, but we try to hit on it, we try to touch on it, right? I think it's important to connect with our Jewish brothers and sisters and to be able to reflect on these things and to be able to uh, embrace these types of things. As we go through the Torah, who here has learned so much by going through the Torah portions in past years? I can say I have, right? And it seems as if every year that we go through the Torah portion, we're able to reflect more and more of these things, these deeper understandings, these deeper meanings of life and about what God has in store for us as his people. So today, um, I, I actually titled my message, Built to Last, right? And uh, it'll start to make sense at one point. But I want to start off by just telling you that in this Torah portion, which is Yitro, right, which means Jethro, um, it, it, we're, it talks about the commandments, right? And the commandments are listed in Exodus 20, verses 1, right? And you have the Ten Commandments. And believe it or not, the Ten Commandments are not really called the Ten Commandments. Did anyone not know that? Did anyone know that they're actually called the Ten Matters? Why is it called the Ten Matters? Because they matter. Amen? All right, cool. So it's called the Hadavarim, which are the Ten Words that God has. Now, something to point out about that. Can I get two people to grab me the whiteboard over here? Let's set that up. I'm going to use the whiteboard a little bit today. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be breaking down some words. I'm going to use a little bit of hieroglyphics. I'm going to break down some things to really connect some dots, right, within the, the scripture. I want to show something that I think is the foundation of our faith, but yet skipped over a lot of the time, right? So the word the, the word Hadavarim, notice that the, the first word there is ha, though it's a hey, okay? I don't know how many people are learning Hebrew. Has anyone learned Hebrew? Anyone know their, their Hebrew all, all of bet? Okay, a little bit, okay? Kitzat, kitzat, okay? So that means a little bit in Hebrew. So the hey has a numerical value of five, right? And um, it, what it is, is it's the word for the. So if I say like the Torah, it'd be HaTorah, right? The Torah. Well, why? What does that mean? So, if anyone understands like how English is put together or uh, these languages, Hebrew is a Semitic language. It's an action language. Through an action language, we have what we call an article. And when we have an article, it is a definite article, right? So it's like the Torah, right? And so this is what a hay looks like um, right here. This little part right here is actually not connecting. Okay. If it connects, I don't know why this marker is not working, but if it connects like that, this is called a het. Okay. So there's two different letters right here. One letter is a hey and one letter is a het. They make a difference, right? Because one is called a guttural where you make this sound with your throat and the other one is a hey sound. I always explain it like this because if we say hey, right, hey, it can breathe, hey, right? And right here, it's het, right? Because it has to stop. You can't breathe, right? It's like the chimney that allows the smoke to go out. So that's a simple way that I understand it and see it. But these words are important because anytime we see this word hey, right, which means the, it's pointing to something really important. For instance, if I said king was at the, you know, a king was, right, this, this word using a king or the king. If I said the king, I'm actually talking about a specific king, am I not? Right? So th that, that starts to make sense. So when it says hadavarim, there's only one set of commandments. Therefore, if the, the Catholics can't change the commandments, and that doesn't make it valid, right? You, you can't change the commandments. And, and say, oh, oh, that's valid, right? I mean, these are only one set of commandments that God gave us. There's 10 of them. There are 10 declarations. There's 10 words. There's 10 matters because they matter that much. God put an article and said that they were the Hadavarim, the commandments of God, right? The commandments of God. There is no other commandments but the 10 commandments. Okay, there's a lot of commandments, but they all stem off of those 10, right? Okay. That's what the Torah portion is about, is about the commandments. It's about other things, but that will, that's basically what we're going to be focused on a little bit today, but in a little different way. So I want to start by talking to you about what I do. I'm a builder, OK? 
okay? I don't know if any of you understand what it is to be a builder, um, but if you've ever built a home or you've done construction uh, in, in any time in your life, you would start to understand what it actually takes to build a house, right? There's a structure to a home, okay? So I ask you a question. Is a house built in a day? Okay, is a house built in two days? I'm going to tell you when a customer asks me, okay, I, I have a company called Bible Built Texas Homes. If, if, I, if I go and I'm bidding a job and I, and I say that I'm, I'm going to build your house, one of the first things that they ask me is how long is it going to take you, right? And, and there could be variables along that way, right? But if I'm building a brand new house, that's what I'm talking about, building a brand spanking new house from scratch, there's nothing you're tearing apart. It's not a, a remodel. It's not an addition, right, Aaron? Um, it, it's about it's about the the whole fact that you're starting from a foundation, okay? And then you're framing this house up. You're you're structuring this home, and you're building this house. So, what I'm trying to tell you is that it's important to understand what we're doing and how we're doing it. And there's a wrong way to build a house, and there's a correct way to build a house, okay? I'm going to give you a quick example. If I have what they call a two-by-four wall that sits like this, okay? Well, what you, when you're cutting a roof, a roof line in, you have a, what you call a rafter, and it comes off like this, okay? It's called a tail, and it comes in like this. Then it has right here, it's called a seat cut. It actually cuts out like this so that it sits on top of the wall. That's an important factor within building because if you don't put that seat there, it doesn't have a bearing point directly, right? And if I were to just run a wall like this and have a rafter that comes off like this, there's nothing to bear weight. So the only weight value is right there, which will start to fall and you obviously can't even nail it, right? There's no way to actually attach it to the framing. So there's incorrect ways, is what I want to tell you, to build a house, right? And so what happens when the house is completed, though? What happens when you're done building a house? It becomes a home. Okay? It becomes a home. And I want to tell you something. When you build a home, a home is a place where you can rest. A home is a place where you can be at peace. You can be within yourself, right? Like, this is a safe zone. Is your home not a safe zone? Sure it is. You know, when you get home, you take your shoes off. You can, it's like, oh, you can just unload. You get on the couch. You're like, man, it's been a tough day. This is my house, right? And it becomes a home when it's completed. Okay, do you just invite anyone into your home? Because it's that, it's that important, right? It, it, you value your, your, your private space or your home. So who do we invite into our home? We invite those that we trust, right? We invite our brothers, our sisters, our family, our friends, people that you trust. And so you, you allow them to come into your home. And, and I believe that there's so many symbols that, 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 that start to talk about these things when building a house. The symbolism behind walking through a threshold. Okay, in Israel, they have the mezuzah on their doorpost, right? That's like the uh, commandments within there, or the Shema, rather. Um, and then when you walk through the threshold, you're entering into a covenant. You see, you're entering into this covenant with that family. If they allow you to come through the threshold of the, the home, that's actually, that's actually really good. That means that they say, you're my friend, right? And so it's their responsibility to make you feel welcome at that point. Right? And in Israel, do you know that like even thieves won't even break through your door? They don't want to step over the threshold because they know there's, there's depth within that, right? Like the, the blood that was put on the doorpost and over the threshold of the home. And so they would rather break through the windows to, to, to steal or to rob you. It's the fact that they have respect for what the Bible actually states and says. Okay, so my, my question is, is that our, we're building a house. Right? And we're going to build a house that we can value, that we can love, that we can enjoy. And I'm talking this physical home. But now I want to talk about building a spiritual house. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Right? We're going to talk about the spiritual house because 
I'm going to ask you something. If you built a house that you did not love, would you want to go to it? If you built a house that you enjoyed, like, would you want to go to it? Okay. So I'm going to ask you something. If we're building a house, are we building a house that's comfortable for us, or are we building a house that's comfortable for God? Are we building a house that he's comfortable with being in? And I'm talking about possessing the Holy Spirit at this point, right? Are you building your house so that God's Holy Spirit, his Ruach HaKodesh, will enter in and want to dwell there? Or are we building a house that's full of what we desire? That what, what, what makes us comfortable? And he doesn't want to dwell in that house because of what's in it. You know, is the house clean, right? Or is it filthy, right? Is it filthy full of sin? Is it filthy full of, of your own lusts? Is it filthy full of these things where God doesn't want to enter into that house? Or is the house clean? Is it desirable? Where he wants to rest instead of you. Does that make sense? So that's something I want to touch on today because I think that that's a really important element in how to build a, a house that's great. So how much greater of responsibility do you have then with building a house that God desires to be in. And now I'm not talking about a physical house, guys. Like, I, I, I build these physical houses, but I'm talking about a house that God dwells in. Are you building the house that God desires? That he will dwell within? Are we using the right materials when building this house? Where are we getting our information? Where, where, how are we building this, this house, this temple? How are we forming this, this house so God can dwell in it? Are we counting the cost before we even built the house? Are we, are we talked about you know, counting the cost because the cost is great, right? Tribulation and trials will follow as a believer, as a disciple of, of his, right? And, and so are we counting the costs when building this house? I mean, before you're baptized, we count the cost, do we not? We don't just walk into it and say, oh, I'm, I'm going to be baptized. I accept. I will do all that you say. What happened to Israel during that time? You know, Israel was divorced because of their sin, following after other gods. God didn't want to dwell in that house. That house was corrupt. And it says in the book of Isaiah chapter 5, and it says that he, he raked all the rocks. He did all this stuff, and he planted seeds. He did everything that he was supposed to do to plant a vineyard that would give him superior grapes. And what took place? He only got inferior grapes. Right? He took all the necessary steps. He, he literally outlines it and goes through all these steps. And then tells you that it did not produce good grapes. And so as we're building our house, we need to use the right materials. And so there's three types of homes, right? There's a house we live in. There's a community. And then there's the spiritual temple. All of these are types of houses. It's the, the house of God, right? The house of God. The physical house that we live in. And it's the spiritual house, which is our own temple. And so you got the physical home, the spiritual home, and lastly, the eternal home. The word for house, and I'm just going to put it up on the whiteboard for those that don't know. The word for house is bite, right? It, it's, a, it's a bet, yud, and a tav. Okay? This is bite. This is the word for house. Does anyone in this room know what the root word is for this house? Okay. Does anyone know what the root of this is? Okay. Do you know that this word scripturally is used 1,881 times in the Bible? 1,881 times this word is used in the Bible. 
Okay, I'm going to tell you that this word is probably used more than a lot of words in the Bible. This is the word for house. I would say that this, the, the main usage of this word in structure is actually used as in Bait Israel, right? Bet Israel, house of Israel, which is the community, right? It's the middle ground. It's not your physical house. It's not your temple. It's the middle ground where brothers and sisters come and dwell in unity. Amen? And so then, interesting enough that the root of this word is a word that looks like this. It's bana in Hebrew. Okay? This word means built. Almost put a D. This word is built. Okay? So it's not house now. It's built. This is the root of this word, house. Does everyone follow? Are you getting what I'm saying? Because it doesn't become a house until you build it. Right? It doesn't become a house until you build it. And do you know that in Genesis 2, verse 21 and 22, it says this. Let's turn there. Grab your Bibles. Let's turn to Genesis 2, verse 21. And let's read two verses. says in verse 21, so that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of the ribs and closed the flesh at the place. Then, in verse 22, the Lord God made the rib he had taken from a man into a woman and brought her to the man. Okay, is that what your translation pretty much says? Okay, so did he make the woman? Did he make the woman? So he already made the man, right? So did he make the, 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 the did he make the woman out of the man? So did you know that it's interesting, but the word used there is the word bana. He built the woman from the man. You see, God already created man. He created every element within the man. Everything that the man was is what he needed. Now he just needed to build the woman from the man. And you wonder why you need to be married, right? And, and why your, your wife compliments you and finishes your sentences. Well, because this word echad actually means one, right? And in order to be echad together, oneness, you have to be completed. What if I were to propose to you this? What if I were to propose the fact that God created you to be both male and female in the way of thinking? I'm not talking looks. He created man. But he created you to be both sides of the brain. But then what he did was he took out of, and he says, Yehovah Elohim et Hatzalah, which means to form a share, lacha min ha'aretz. Le'asa, to, to put forth the man. And at the end here he says, ben, which means bana. The root of that word is bana. And so he creates this, this, this woman by building her from what was already created and made at the beginning of creation. Why is that so important? Because in order to be completed in what God created at the beginning, you have to become a chad with a woman. See, when you get married, she completes you. The way that God formed you from the foundation of the earth. And men, by the way, I'm just telling you right now, we can't deny that. Right? We know that there's elements of the woman and the touch and the, the nurturing. The, 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 the wife brings so much that the husband does not bring. And that's what, if, if you're open to that, then she completes you in a manner that is so amazing. It fulfills the scripture right here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. 
And so that's what they mean by saying to become one, echad. So for instance, Yeshua and the creator of the universe are echad. They are one. That's the way we are to become one in this way. So I just wanted to kind of expound upon that because I wanted you to see that the word bana comes from the root word house, or excuse me, from that the word house comes bana, which means to build. It means built. Okay, and he built the woman from the man in order to have a living house. You see, he breathed the, the breath of life into the woman, and she became a living house. What does it say in the book of Proverbs? We are instructed to build a house, not from a rib, but from a foundation. And so from a child, hopefully we're brought up by our, our parents to teach us these things about life. And one day we, we start to claim these as our own. And when we claim these as our own, we now start to build a house upon a foundation. Proverbs 24. Let's turn to Proverbs 24. In Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4, a house is built by wisdom, and it is established by understanding. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with every precious and beautiful treasure. See, today the Torah portion is about the Ten Commandments, and we are creating a house established on his word. Remember I told you you need the right materials? Well, the materials are his word. It's the commandments that we're to implement, we are to grab, and we are to allow to penetrate our hearts and our minds and our souls. It says in Exodus 32.16, now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. I want you to turn to that verse. I think, I think this is a very interesting verse that's overlooked and, and, and not seen for the value that it should be seen from a Hebrew perspective. So let's turn over to Exodus 32, verse 16. Chapter 32, verse 16. Does anybody have a translation that wants to read a translation that's different from what I just read? You have one? Now come on up. Now you say, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Okay. All right, so it's, it's pretty close translation. Does anybody have a different tr translation other than that one? You have one, David? Do you want to come up and, and, and read that? Okay. And the tablets were the work of Elohim, and writing was the writing of Elohim engraved on the tablets. Okay. Another possessive pronoun being used for, for God's name. But what are, what, what are we getting out of this? We're getting the fact that he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. And engraved upon them was the Ten Commandments. Okay, what if I were to propose to you that the actual Hebrew has a word that is often not used? Actually, I'm going to tell you how many times it's used within the scripture. One. One time. Okay? It's the word harut. And it's in, the, it's in the context that he says that he, uh, harut, la har, uh, harachot, okay? He placed upon the tablets, he engraved them on the tablets, the Ten Commandments. This word engraved is an adjective. Notice that the verbiage that's being used here, he says, now the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God. That was the verb. Now he's going to describe it engraved on the tablets was God, right? Like God engraved these on there. So it's the adjective being described. Well, that adjective in that Hebrew word means liberty and freedom. 
okay, that, that man, that like changes some things. Did you know that the, the commandments that God gave you back in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, sets you free? You know, in this concept that Yeshua sets you free because he is the walking, living Torah. He is the walking word of God, is he not? And so he, he, he's literally telling you, though, that this word that he's describing as an adjective engraved upon the stones sets you free and gives you liberty by his commandments alone. But then Yeshua comes into the picture and he fulfills that same thing and becomes the walking, living word of God. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is, is, is what God is doing here? You know, and, and what, what sickens me, and, and honestly, is that people want to remove the Ten Commandments from the courthouse. They want to remove the commandments from the schools. And they just removed freedom from their lives. They just re they removed liberty from their lives. Because these commandments set you free. Believe it or not, they set you free. Because by the word of God, we should be living. And if we live according to the word, then we would be blessed. Sounds like freedom to me. But if we don't live by the word of God, we're going to be we're going to be the opposite of blessed. We're not going to receive the blessing. As we build our house, we need to fill our hearts with the knowledge of God. And the rooms are filled with every precious treasure as we become more mature in the word of God. We move from room to room. So let's let's describe that for a second. Does this make sense as you, man, if, if I could ask you two years ago, was your knowledge level of the word of God or the understanding of God, has it grown in two years? Has it grown in a year? How about six months? We're always growing, right? There, we're always learning new things. We're, we're always uh, th these things are complete, they're always evolving in us, in our bodies, in our, we're becoming more like God every day. And that's exactly what he wants us to be, is he wants our house to resemble his house. You see, when people see us, they want to see God's house. And the only way we can do that is if we, we borrow the elements to make us holy as he is holy. Because it says in the book of Leviticus 11, during the clean and unclean um, statutes that are there, he says at the end of the chapter, for I am the Lord your God and I am holy, therefore you shall be holy. Go eat whatever you want, guys. Right? That makes sense. You know, he, he literally describes what you can and can't eat, then says that I am holy and you shall be holy too, meaning you shouldn't eat those. Well, no, the New Testament says you can't. No, that's no. No, 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 I'm not buying it. It's not true. It's not real. It's fake. It's a lie. That is the house that you don't want to be building. We want to be building upon a solid foundation. And so we want to make sure that the framing members that are creating our walls and our roof, everything has bearing points, right? We're planting those roots deep within. So John 14, verse 1 through 3, I'll just read it. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. What is he talking about? What is he saying in this verse? That my Father's house has many rooms. What if I told you that not everyone is on the same level? You see, my new friend Paul, you might be in the, the, the back room, right, in the, in the, on the left side of the house. And I might be on the back of the house, on the right side of the house, in another room. And, you know, others, Aaron, you might be in, in the front of the house in another room. And Ryan, you see what I'm saying? Everyone's in a different room. But he says, he says that my house has many rooms. If not, I would have told you so. So he's talking about levels of, of learning. You see, as you grow in knowledge of God's word, you start to change rooms. 
because now you're draw you're 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 climbing that ladder. Remember Jacob's ladder? You're climbing that ladder slowly, right? As your as your knowledge increases, as you're learning about God, these are the things that follow, right? You're 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 stepping into other rooms, and so we have to respect that, right? Like we're not all in the same room. We're not all in the same. Sometimes we're not even in the same house. I hope we're in the same house. But sometimes we're not. And, and, and sometimes it's okay to not be in the same house because that just means that you're going through something. And, and, and you know what? Your brother wants you to come back in. And so it's our job to make sure and hold each other accountable for that very thing so that they, come on back into the house. We're going to put you over in this room. Give you some time before you move to the next room, right? And this, is a, this isn't a, a, a strange thought. This is actually a very scriptural thought within the scripture. So I'm going to tell you a little story. Do you remember the story about the three little pigs? Okay. Did you know that's a biblical story? It's a biblical story. I want you to think about this for a second. I don't know the narrative so perfectly that I don't even want to butcher it, right? So I'm just going to read a short narrative of this. <laughs> Bear with me. All right. So once upon a time, there were three little pigs who lived with their mother in a meadow. One day, the mother pig said to the three little pigs, you need to go out into the world and make your own way. So they waved goodbye, and out into the world they went. I want you to think about yourself in this, this thought, right? The pigs decided to build houses near the woods. A big bad wolf lived in the woods. He was not happy when he saw the three little pigs building houses nearby. And so the first little pig, he was lazy. He made a house of straw, and the big bad wolf huffed and he puffed, and he blew the house down. And the second little pig worked a little harder than the first little pig, and he made a house full of twigs, sticks. And the big bad wolf huffed and he puffed, and he blew the house down. I'm doing that too, so wait. <laughs> and then the third little pig, he made a house of bricks. And the big bad wolf huffed and he puffed and he puffed. The house did not fall down. You see, this made the big bad wolf very, very angry. He went up onto the roof and tried to get into the house through the chimney. He climbed into the chimney and slid down into a pot of boiling water. He ran out of the house and never came back. So I want you to think about that in this, this, as a parable, okay, within what we're talking about. You one day left your parents, and you left the theology, maybe, of your parents. And you went into the world, and you said goodbye, Right? And when you went into the world, you decided to build a house. And I'm not talking about a physical house, right? I'm, I'm not. Okay, one pig was lazy, and he built it out of something that was going to fall over. The foundation was weak. The next one wasn't as lazy, but wasn't, wasn't diligent enough to build it out of the materials that would last, right? And he built it out of sticks. And guess what? The world blew him over too. You see, because the world just wants you to fall. They want you to not believe in God. You see, Satan, you know, the adversary just wants you to, he wants you to disappear. He wants you to not believe in God. He wants you to fall short of God's glory. He wants you to be doomed forever. He doesn't want you to be in the kingdom. He doesn't want you to be in the house. He wants you out of the house. He doesn't want you to be in the rooms. Not ever, ever. Not one room, not the bathroom, not the, ha the living room, not the family room, not the dining room. He doesn't want you in the house. So what does he do? He attacks you. And if your house is not built on a solid foundation, it will blow over. Because remember I was saying, count the cost before you build? Right? If we're not counting the cost, and we're not taking those costs serious enough, to build that house out of bricks like the third little pig. Guess what? One day that wolf in sheep's clothing possibly even is going to come and they're going to huff and they're going to puff. 
and they're going to blow your house right over. And I'm going to tell you something. As a builder, it's the worst thing in the world. One time I built a house, not kidding. Braced it off, and we had about 80 mile an hour winds, and I came back the next morning, and guess what it looked like? <laughs> most depressing thing you'd ever see. Loss of lumber, loss of time, loss of materials, right? Everything. And it almost gives you this like this thought like do I even want to pick up this material and put this house back together or I or do I quit? So I, I'm just saying in, in the fact that you're building a house and you get hit really hard. Let's say that you're hurt, right? Let's say someone hurts you bad. I'm not talking bad. I'm talking really bad. Something in life stabs you. Gets you really hard. Do you just fall over? You know? Or did you build this house from a solid foundation? I'm going to tell you right now, that is the test. Because that will be the time in your life that God is now saying, are you one of mine? Did you build the house? Did you count the cost? Did you make it out of the correct materials? Or were you that lazy little kid that built it out of scrap? Did you not value the birthright? Or did you just give it away for a price to win? Right? I mean, this is, this is the truth. Like, this is real life stuff fact is, is that we're building a real house here, and it's not even a physical one. It is a house that is so much greater and so much more important than your physical home. We are building a house that God, the Holy Spirit, wants to dwell in. And we have to be willing, and our house has to look inviting. stable, built in wrong materials. So it says in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, 28 through 30, I'm just going to read this as an example of what we're talking about. Verse 28, it says, out of all the tribes of Israel, I chose your house to be my priest. And here he's speaking of the priest of uh, Eli. Remember the priest Eli? And he says, to offer sacrifices on my altar to be uh, to burn incense and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your forefathers' family all the, all the Israelites fire and fire offerings. Why then? So he gives all this to them. He gives them, he gives them the house to be a priest in his home. He literally invited him into his home and said, you can be the priest within my house. And in verse 29 he says this, why then do you why then do all of your all of you despise my sacrifices and offerings that I require at the place of worship? Speaking of God's house. You have honored your sons more than me by taking yourselves fat with the best part of all the offerings of my people Israel. Do you remember the story there? When, when, when the sons of Eli, Eli were going in and taking the best part of the offerings, stealing the offerings before all, all the children of Israel were giving their heart and giving their offerings to God, and he was going in and stealing the offerings. In verse 30, Therefore, this is the declaration of the Lord, that the Lord of Israel, I did say that your family and your forefathers' family would walk before me forever, but now... This is the Lord's declaration. No longer. For those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disgraced. I mean, he's like, are you building the correct house? Some often worry about their house looking different from another house. No, I, I, I don't want to look different. I don't, I don't want to look like that. Because I'm worried that people are going to look at me and, and bring, they're going to shame me. They're going to they're gonna make fun of me. I don't want to look that way. 
Who cares what they think about you? What does God think about you? What does the creator of the universe think about you? Maybe it doesn't matter as long as your house looks like the house of God. I think our house needs to look exactly like the house of God. You know, in 1 Peter 4, 17 through 18, it says, For the time has come for the judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, a righteous person is saved with difficulty, how will an unrighteous person be saved? How? Because I'm going to tell you from, from my own personal experience in life, this is not easy. This is extremely difficult at times. To stand up for what is right. I mean, you young you youngsters that, like, I'm a youngster, I guess, but um, I'm just claiming it. I'm claiming it, even if it's not true, see? I'm claiming life over myself right now. No, I mean, honestly, the world just wants to beat you up. And, and the, you're going to learn that, that, that you're going to look different. You're going to be different from the rest of us. But you're also going to resemble what God wants, and he's going to be pleased with it. And from that, there will be many blessings that come in your life. 1 Peter 4, verse 14, it says, If you are uh, ridiculed for the name of the Messiah, you are blessed because the spirit of the glory and of God rests upon you. What is it? You know, you'll be persecuted for the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach. Amen? And we talked about this when we, when we were talking about counting the cost as a disciple of his. Luke 6, verse 46 through 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a solid foundation on the rocks. And when the flood came, the river crashed against the house and couldn't even shake it because it was built well. There's the, three, the third little pig, huh? Third little pig right there. But the one who hears and does not act like a man who built a house on the ground with a solid foundation. The river crashed against it. Immediately it collapsed. And the destruction of that house was great. There's the first and second little pig. You see, if we take shortcuts thinking that we can save money or save time, not, not really invest these, the correct materials in building this, then we're robbing God of his tithe and his sacrifice. Because your tithe is not just your money. Your tithe is your time and devotion to God. If I were to ask you, are you giving at least 10% of your increase back to God in time? I mean, are you giving 10% of your time back to God? He allows you to have 90% of your own time. Are you giving 10 back? Just kind of changing the concept a little bit rather than money, right? Starts to think think about these things just a little bit deeper. The shortcuts that we take, we think that one won't, won't, won't notice. But there's one that will. And you know who that is. And ultimately, that's what matters. So I'm speaking on what life is. Seriously, y'all. I'm, I'm speaking on, like, what life is. It's not about how many worldly achievements that we have. I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, like, achievements are amazing. I'm not going to downplay those at all. Those that have, have recently achieved some things, congratulations, awesome, good job. But the best achievement that we can make is building a house that God wants to dwell in. The word of God is true. His house is, is all about you. The whole storyline is about you. He loves you that much. 
You see, a house is where you only let certain people in. Well, God is allowing you into his house. Come, dine and feast with me. But we have to be prepared. See, it's about emptying yourself in complete humility. We should be servants of the Most High God. Emptying ourselves, allowing us to be an open book to knowledge and to digest the Word of God properly to be able to even convey this Word of God to others and to be the disciple that He called us to be because we are disciples of God. That means that we have a job. We are called to teach other people what He has taught us and believe me, it is a blessing to know what we know. And we can take this for granted at times, but we this is a blessing, seriously. So Ephesians 20, verse 20, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, verse 20, says, Build on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Yeshua Messiah himself as the cornerstone. I find it way cool that someone picked the song Cornerstone today. Who did that? Whoever picked the song Cornerstone, we are to build our foundation upon the cornerstone. That is Yeshua. He is the rock. He is the sure foundation. He is the Son of God. He's the exalted. Does anyone know what the word is for stone? That is the word for stone. It's a then. Okay? It means stone. Does anyone not know what hieroglyphics is so I don't have to explain just to save time? Hieroglyphics, I'll just give you a quick, it's Egyptian, you know, writing, but it's also used with the letters within the Hebrew. Okay, so I don't know if anyone hasn't heard of Jeff Benner, but Jeff Benner has a great book out with the hieroglyphics that have symbolism to show the value from a picture. So for instance, this is an ox. Okay? That's an ox. And this here is a house. That's why the first letter of the word bait starts with a bet. Bet for house. Right? This right here is a fish. Life. So what is the word saying here? He's the strength of the house of the living. He's the cornerstone. A sure foundation. He is the strength of the house of the living God. That's pretty cool. You see, the fact that God would even show us that within hieroglyphics is pretty cool. I mean, it's not something we didn't already know, right? But it's something that supports what we already knew. It's not the other way around. We don't, we don't take this and go, that, that means that, right? No, it's, this literally means stone. And so when we're reading these scriptures, it's using this word stone upon a rock. It says right here in Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, the Lord God said, look, I have laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will be unshakable. I lay a then, a then. See? A then. Stone. I lay the strength of the house of the living God as a sure foundation. So when we're building this foundation, it makes sense that we would build it upon Yeshua. And this is where I would caution you 
about building your foundation upon wrong materials. You see, we don't want to build our foundation upon, like, what they call Kabbalah, right? We don't want to build our foundation upon Gematria. We don't want to build our foundation upon these, you know, these Apocrypha books and say that, well, they say this, so the Bible must mean this. You see, those books should be additional books that, that, that complement what the Bible already tells us. If I'm going to use Gematria, it's because it already says that. So now I'm going to show you Gematria, which is the numerical value of the, the letters, to equal what it already says. I'm going to basically call a second witness up, is what I'm saying. I won't, you won't ever see me ever teach and say that this, this word means this because the, the, the Gematria says it. But the actual word doesn't say it. So now the Gematria overlooks what the Bible actually says. No, no, it doesn't say that. And it doesn't work that way. And the reason people get so scared off when you say the word Gematria is because they've seen it misused so many times. But the truth is, in the book of Psalms, the Aleph stands as one. This is two, and so on, right? And that's important to know. Because it does have value in a lot of good ways. But again, it has to support the word. And the word has to say it already. And then that's like an extra witness to say, hey, look at this. It even supports it. And so this word, I'm not saying that this word means, you know, earth. But then it says this. That he's the you know strength of the living word or, you know living God. He uh, it already says stone. He is the cornerstone. We are to build our house upon the cornerstone. Why does it say that? It says I'm going to read it again. Therefore the Lord God said, who said? The Lord God said. Literally the Creator of the heavens and the earth is telling you something. Look, I've laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. I have laid the strength of the house of the living God before you. The one who believes will be unshakable. You will be the third pig. No one is blowing your house down. Is that the house you want? That's the house God wants to dwell in. That's the house God wants to dwell in. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 9 through 17 says, For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. You're a building, God's building. According to the God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skill master builder and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. See, I wasn't making of any of these words. Paul speaks of it right here. For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down. That foundation is Yeshua Messiah. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, man, it's bringing the three little pigs into perspective, huh? Thought I was playing around. This is real stuff right here. If anyone works, or if anyone's work that has been built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved. But only as though through fire. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. Everything that we just went over, the storyline of the three little pigs, building the right materials, everything is what Paul is speaking of right here. I'm going to tell you Paul, out of all people, would know what that looks like. You see, because he built his foundation not on that. And he learned about it. And when he learned about what it was to be a servant of Yeshua, he said that it was, it was, um, it was all gain in the book of Philippians. He says, he says, give it all up. It doesn't matter. Give, I, I give everything because there's much to gain in Yeshua. Crucify. 
put me to the test. All of it. There's much to gain in, the, in, in Yeshua. That, that's Paul's thought, right? So he saw exactly what it was to build a foundation, and he, he built a foundation that was not on Yeshua, and God opened his eyes. That veil was not the, the separation between him and the book any longer. You see, when he looked, Yureh HaSefer, right? When he looked upon the book, the Hadavarim, HaNefesh, right? It went into his soul. See? It impacted him. And when it impacted him, he was able to speak a testimony upon it. And it was all about Yeshua. He could be in prison in Rome, and he was glorifying God. I mean, just put yourself in Paul's place for a second, right? I mean, he was crucified. I mean, that guy, like, he went through a lot of stuff. And, you know, it's so interesting that if you start to talk, if you talk to people that don't understand Paul, they, they, they always, like, oh, I'm, not, <coughs> I'm not sure about his book. I'm not sure about Paul. Well, maybe you don't understand him. Because I used to be one of those. I used to read my Tanakh, my Torah. And I, and I read it nonstop, constantly. Because I didn't know Paul. And when I started to learn Paul, Paul's one of my favorite writers. And you know why? Because he has experienced what it is to be an Orthodox. He was the Orthodox of Orthodox. He knew what it was to, to, to read the Torah. He knew what it was to go through the traditions. And he speaks on all of it with insight of that exactly. So, I mean, honestly, it, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So, remember I warned you about reading other books or having these other insights that would uh, impact our building of our house, right? What does the book of Revelation say in chapter 22? So now we're kind of at the end of the road here, right? In Hebrew, they have a saying, besofaderech. It means that you're, that is awesome. Besofaderech. That's awesome. But it actually means it's the end of the road. You see, it's so awesome, it doesn't get any better, so you're at the end of the road. It makes sense, huh? So here we're at the end of the road, Revelation 22, 18 through 19. I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Woo! We don't want to be adding to this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city, which are written about in this book. So we must absorb observe, process, act with each bit of information that God has given us in the Torah in order to build our house correctly. And when building our house, we must be complete submission to God. Complete submission to our Heavenly Father. Humbling ourselves so that we can truly learn the hidden value of who our Father really is. So the scripture also says, in Hosea 4, 6, that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. So if we reject knowledge, we're not going to be building upon a solid foundation. If we put other things in front of that, it says in the book of Deuteronomy too, that's where uh, Revelation 22 gets it. It says, do not add or subtract from my commandments. So we've already been warned in two places. We need to make sure that we accept the knowledge, be open and humble, knowing that God is God and we are not. God is smarter than us. The book of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 and 6, 1 through 6, it says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, consider Yeshua, the apostle, the high priest of our confession. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was in all God's household. For Yeshua is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder 
has more honor than the house. Now, even the house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. You see, and that's the way it is even building a physical house. The builders that are actually building it don't get the glory. It's usually the one that's like running the job. And you're not even putting the house together. God is building your house by calling you out of the world. We just need to listen and act. Moses was faithful in verse 5. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. But Messiah was faithful in a, uh, as a son over his household. And we are that household if we hold on to the confidence and the hope in which we boast. And we boast about the Messiah Yeshua, a sure foundation. Amen? Because he is the strength of the house of the living God. Are we building the house that we are going to be comfortable in, or are we building the house that God is going to be comfortable in? I'm going to leave you with this scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. God's house will last forever, and I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm going, to, I'm going to leave you with this. God's house lasts forever, and no one's blowing it over. Amen. Shabbat shalom.